from the beginning it was a great mystery. But God revealed it unto his prophets and his apostles and his disciples. And God wants us to realize that that great mystery is the blessing of the church, the calling forth of God's people. And this morning, I would like to speak about that. Best I can. Give God my best. Amen? Colossians 1, 26 and 27 says, Even the mystery which had been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the purpose for the hope of glory is that we'd be able to spend eternity with the Father. Amen? Got to move my mic a little. There we go. Ephesians chapter three, uh, chapter 1, excuse me. Starting at verse 3 says, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now the church looks at that and says, well now that's just spiritual blessings. That's like uh, the gifts of the uh, Spirit and working in the gifts of the Spirit. Well that covers the entire spiritual aspect of our uh, relationship with God. God covers every need that we have, rather it be a spiritual need, a physical need, Whatever needs are in our life, God has provided for every need for our life. And God wants us to know that he took care of every detail when Jesus went to that cross. Covered everything. We just celebrated Easter. Resurrection Sunday, if you will. And we have such a privilege and opportunity to look back and to see the things that God has done for us. If we look back at our own lives, we'll be able to see the changes that have happened, the transformation that happened in our lives, the changes that we went through after we become born again, the things that God has done in our own lives. Amen? It says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. If he's in us, then there ought to be some outward signs. And those outward signs start with the love of God. We ought to love the brethren. We ought to love our... Yes, thank you, Father. So we love him, and we love them. But we have to love us, too. We have to love ourselves. Because if you're a Christian... You have God's dwelling inside of you. And there should be such a change in you that you shouldn't even reflect the man you used to be. People see me, they say, you're not the same person I used to know. That's because something's changed on the inside. Amen? And that's Christ. When he came in, I went out. I moved out when he came in. Amen? I died to me. I died to self. I'm dead with him, but yet I'm alive through him. I reign with him, and we shall reign with him for all eternity. Amen? And in reigning is rulership. And in reigning and rulership, there's expectation of God in us. God expects us to be a certain way and do certain things. Amen? I love this. This is such a good word. It says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. See, this is all about God's will. We get this idea that it's about us, but it's not about us. We are supposed to surrender our will and let him take over. And when we do that, then we're going to go places in God. But we need to, uh, this is a very good example. Thank you, Father. If you realize that this place has probably about 400, 500 seats in it right now, just roughly speaking, I'm assuming pretty close to that. Okay. And 
it should be packed out. But the flesh wants its own way. And those that live within 20 miles of here that could be coming to all of these services, okay, they have set their self to this point. Eh, it's early in the morning and it's cold and it's not quite like what I want it to be. It's not about what they want. It's about what God wants. Do you know how many times God can speak to you in a day as often as you're willing to listen to him? And this is only what? One, two, three, three services a day, correct? Three services a day. In This is a great revival going on here. And what God is saying is this. He's saying, listen, his voice is a still small voice. It's not that roaring world out there that's roaring, roaring, roaring. If you go to a, a waterfall, as you walk to it, get closer and closer to it, you begin to hear it getting louder and louder and louder. God's voice is a still, small voice, but yet it's the voice of many waters, okay? When he speaks, our innermost being reverberates with the power of God, even when he just speaks with a still, small voice. But when we walk up to a waterfall, we couldn't hear God because it's such a roar. And the same thing in the world, if we're in the world, and we're tied up to the world as Christians, hooked up to the world system. It's such a roar that we can't hear God. And God is, he's our father. We should desire to hear him far and above anything else we want to hear in this life. Amen? I think about the, uh, the wide road that leads to destruction and the straight and narrow way that leads to life eternal. If we will listen and get in Christ so that he can be in us and live through us and do the things that God wants us to do and be led by him, then we'll find that we'll have uh, peace, we'll have joy, we'll have love, we'll have all of the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives and the gifts of the Spirit will work in our lives freely. I was speaking about that last night at church. I was talking about how Jesus, when he prayed for somebody, he meant what he was saying. And these words in this book are the words that Jesus spoke, the ones in red. And the rest of the word in this book is Jesus also because it's God's plan for the ages is in that book. And we have to realize that plan comes through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. God has the plan, Jesus is the word of that plan, and the Holy Spirit is the enforcing power behind that plan. And they're inside of us. So everything that we're doing should be revelation of God's plan through his word and anointed by the Holy Ghost and power. And that's why God just brought me over into this and said, on with it. And I said, okay, Lord. Anyhow, so verse 6 says, to the praise of of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved. So when we get Christ in us, then we're acceptable in the beloved. And we get him in us by getting into him. Amen. We're baptized into the body of Christ by receiving him. And then Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit come to dwell inside of us as we receive Jesus in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Do you see that oftentimes it says in the word of God, the riches, the riches, the riches. That's not necessarily speaking about money, but it's not not speaking about money. But what it is talking about is that God is abundantly provided for the church in his riches of his presence and everything that is in his kingdom belongs to us because he made us joint heirs with Christ when we come into the body. When Jesus re went to the cross and redeemed us from the curse and made us joint heirs with him, 
that brought us into all the provision that God has in the spirit, in the natural, in the soulish. Okay? All righty. Wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence. God puts his wisdom in us. If you read Proverbs, you will find that wisdom is constantly working to break through into our hearts. Just like when Jesus went to the cross, there's a song that says the Holy Spirit's face was pressed against the veil, waiting, waiting for him to say, it is finished. The moment he said, it is finished, it says that the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. God opening free access to mankind. Every single one, everyone that's watching, everyone that's here, everyone that will hear this, wherever they may find this, laying on the road or whatever, you know. You never know where you'll find the word of God. But whoever hears it, reads it, watches it, God is giving every person an opportunity to be a part of his family, his kingdom. And we live in a day and time when it's drawing close to the end of the time that we, as we know it. It's coming to, it's coming to a close for the time of the Gentiles. The church age is coming to a close. I don't know how long it's going to be. Oh, I know that it's very soon to be happening. And soon is in our time. Soon is in the time period God made from the beginning with Adam and Eve to he ends this thing. It's a short period of time in eternity. What's 6,000 years or 7,000 years in eternity? It's just a little spot but it's coming to a close of God's grace, pouring his love out to humanity. And God is talking to us that he wants us to hear and be wise instead of shrugging our shoulders. I have a little granddaughter. If, she don't, if you talk to her and she don't understand what you're saying, she'll do this. She'll go. You know how it is when you don't particularly interested in what somebody's saying, and they say something to you, and you go, you know, something like that. Well, that's the way she is. But God don't want us to be that way to him. He wants us to find him the most important thing in our life. People say, you know, you got to die and pay taxes. That's the most important thing in life. That's for the world. The most important thing in the life for the world and for the church is to have Jesus Christ on the inside of us. Amen? All right says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. And I would like to read number two here. My fingers is cold. They're not working too good. <laughs> Y'all bear with me, okay? I can't get it apart. <laughs> it's all right. Jesus knows. Amen? All right. It says, Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known unto all nations for the obedience of faith. Romans 16, 25, and 26. So he was saying and is saying that it's so important for us to get this message to the world because there's only a set amount of time for us to bring the world into alignment with God's plan for the ages. God's plan for the ages is for the church to mature to reach the lost in the world, and then when the end comes, to reign with God forever. And reigning is not laying up on a cloud with a harp. 
just playing our heavenly music on our hearts and just wasting eternity on clouds. That's not going to happen. We're going to reign with God. Do you realize that God has created the whole universe out there and it's filled with planets? And someday God could say, okay, I'm going to put the same Genesis program I had here on the earth, I'm going to do it to the rest of the planets. We don't know what God's going to do. He doesn't tell us. The only thing we know is we're going to reign with him. And I don't think he's going to need us to reign over the angels. You know what I mean? I think they got their job to do, just like we're going to have our position. Amen? All right. Now, it says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and that's what I'm talking about here, how much time do you have before the clock runs out? That's what I'm concerned about this morning. I'm concerned about do you have God working through you and inside of you to reach the lost, or are you just sitting on the side somewhere saying, well, it wasn't meant for me. It's meant for every single person in the whole world that's born of a mother, that's born of the seed of man. Every single person, this is meant for us. Every single one of us. Every person on the face of the earth. Yes, even those people standing, I saw them this morning over there in North Korea, marching their communist march. God died, Jesus Christ died for them just like he died for us. They're only held in the powers of darkness because the light of the gospel isn't being brought to them. It's so important for us to realize that. The whole world, God sent us for the whole earth. Amen? God brought us together to minister to the whole earth. Amen? He, and he wants us to minister to every person. Okay? Okay? In, in whom we ha also, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His will, of His own will. That's God, and that's His will, and that's back to what I said before. God's will is our will. It's it should be our will. Our will should be laid aside for God's purpose, whatever it is. Some of you may have a plan for your life. But your plan for your life could take you to hell. Your plan for your life could make you miserable after a few years. You might get started on saying, ah, oh, this is pretty nice. But what are the consequences of being out of God's will? Amen? It's very important for us to realize that God's will is the most important thing in this life that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Do you realize that? When you come into the kingdom, when you give your life to Christ, God seals you by the Holy Spirit, and that seal is your entrance into glory if Jesus should come back while I'm preaching this, for instance. So if I was you right now, no matter who you are, where you're at, and a lot of times people are setting right in the church, and they never give their heart to Jesus, but they've been good churchgoers for years and years and years. And then some people have set in the church pews and gotten bitter, and stayed bitter for years and years and years. But Jesus is coming back. Remember the story of the ten virgins. Five wise and five foolish, okay? The five foolish are those that went to church for years and years and years and years and years. And they had a relationship with Jesus, but it got lukewarm. And the five wise are those five, are those that, have a relationship with Jesus, and they stayed on fire. I mean, they kept that fire burning. 
And they kept the oil flowing too, by the way, okay? Because if you keep the fire burning, God will keep the oil flowing. But when the, oil, when the fire goes out and you get lukewarm, then you lose your perspective of what God has brought you into this earth for. Right now, somewhere in this world, a little infant is being born, probably more than one, as big as the world is, as many people there are. But do you know from this moment on, that little child is in the earth, not in its mother's womb anymore, but it's in the earth, and it's going to leave its mark. Now, its mark can be a mark of glory, bringing glory and honor to the Heavenly Father, or it can be a mark of blemish on the earth where they're going to do nothing and go out of here and suffer the penalty of eternal damnation and loss from the Father. But God loves us, and he doesn't want that for us. He wants us to come into the saving knowledge of his son so that when his son works through us and when the spirit works through us, people will receive the wisdom that they need to walk this life out. Amen? All right. <laughs> Number three. Galatians 3, 26 through 29 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Back to the, uh, our relationship is no longer just uh, a sinner in need of a savior, but it is uh, a saint and a heir and joint heir with Christ to the Father. And God has prepared such a kingdom for us over there. But, you know, he says that we can enjoy those benefits of that kingdom here in this life with persecutions, okay? And that most of that persecution, I find, comes from the church, okay? Because the traditional church believes that you should be if you're a Christian, you should be poor because you should give everything you have to the kingdom of God. Well, I'll tell you, I certainly believe that if the kingdom of God's people, the saints, if you will, are wealthy, I believe that would be more finances to promote the gospel. Isn't that amazing how I thought that up all myself? But I believe that comes out of the word too, okay? Because how can you support something when you don't have anything to support it with? If you always come to the meeting and you got a quarter in your pocket, that reminds me of another uh, religious organization that I used to be affiliated with when I was a sinner. <laughs> come into the church and they reach in their pocket. And I mean people that had money. I mean so much money you would think, what would they do that for? And they reach in their pocket and they'll pick up a quarter and they'll put it in the plate and call it they did something. They was trying to be like the widow with her two mites, I guess, you know. That's false humility. True humility is when you write the check, you put it in an envelope, you put it in the offering, and you never mention that you put anything in the offering. And it's never spoken of because when you get to the other side, then it'll be spoken of. Amen? We need to realize that. There's a lot of things that God wants for us to do in the body of Christ. And most of it is through a spirit of humility, not a spirit of haughtiness and things of that nature. Amen? Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks. This is Paul. And uh, says he ceases not to give thanks 
for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You know, God has revelation and knowledge by the clouds full. Glory clouds. Glory clouds, okay? And he wants to dump it out on the church. But the church is so busy being religious, God can't do it. God wants us not to be religious. God wants us to be faithful and faith-filled and filled with Christ. And Christ is the Word, so we ought to have the Word inside of us. Amen? Amen? All right. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's, we're God's inheritance. Jesus someday is going to give us to the Father. Amen. And we're going to be, God's going to receive us as an inheritance. Amen. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Do you believe in the working power of God, the mighty power of the living God? That's why he gives us revelation and knowledge so that we'll be able to understand the things that God has for us and so we'll be able to use them and do something with them so it'll be counted worthy to be used and to honor God and to break out with uh, joy and laughter in the things that we're doing for God, not walking around like uh, I saw a show recently and there was five or six men and they had uh, black robes on and black hoods over their head and they was walking around and <laughs> might as well have been the death angel. They were horrible. They had no life no light and no joy and no peace in their life, but all they did was walk around in strict obedience unto some master, and it wasn't a godly master because they went around doing evil and harm. And God is a God of love. He's a God of judgment, but he's a God of love. Love comes first. Judgment comes after rejection of the love. Amen? God wants us to love him because he loves us so, and his whole will is for us to partake of his kingdom. But yet, we go around saying, I can work it out myself. I don't need your help, God. I'll do it myself. I want to do it my way. There's a lot of me's, my's, I's, and I will, and whatever out there in the world. But God is trying to talk to us this morning and say, listen, Let's reason together. It says, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow, God's saying. Well, I like my lifestyle. I hear it all the time. I don't want to change that. That's a shame. That's such a hard thing to say because you don't realize that when you reject God's love, you reject the most wonderful experience in human life. And then you get to spend eternity with him. That's so important for us. It's what it's all about. That's why God made us and created us. Amen? All right. Verse 20 of Ephesians uh, chapter 1 says, which, we, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Do you know that this world is a temporary dwelling place for us, okay, in the flesh? And let me rephrase that. In this flesh, we're in a temporary dwelling package in this world. When we come out of this flesh, our spirit man and our soul are going to be with God, okay, until such a time as he restores us back to our physical body. And God has dominion over everything that there is. 
even when we say no, God still has dominion. He is what? What's the word that we use for God? God is... I didn't hear you. Sovereign. Is that what you said? Okay. That's what I was trying to say. God is sovereign. Everything belongs to God. Even the evil that he might show his self strong over it. Okay? I'm not, I'm not reading that here, but just think about it. It says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. And everything has a name. Everything. Even over in uh, Exodus or Leviticus, excuse me, or Deuteronomy, when it starts talking about the diseases, I think in one of the uh, uh, Bibles it says, even the diseases that are known, every disease that's known and unknown is part of the curse. And when people are under the curse and not under Christ, all of that can come upon them, can literally take the life up out of humanity because they reject God. Amen? And I don't want to go on that negative side of it, but I did need to mention that, okay? and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Over in Colossians 2, uh, 1 through 15, I'm going to go there for a minute. It says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them of Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you have the right wisdom and knowledge and understanding, there's nothing impossible to us. Amen? You're richer than somebody who has everything but don't have Jesus because you have Christ and you have the wisdom and knowledge and understanding of God and that can lead you through every detail that you have to go through in your life. But you only get that wisdom and knowledge by getting it into the Word and letting that Word get into your heart. For you, you, you read that Word, you listen to that Word, you speak that Word out of your mouth, and it goes into your mind and your heart, and it builds up inside of you so that whenever a situation may rise up in your life, you always have the Word of God to cover that situation. And you're always in a place where you... Uh, find that God is there to help you in every situation that you may find yourself in. Amen? Paul says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, because believe me, there's plenty of people out there with a, uh, a thought that just comes to their minds, and then they just... We were talking about one this morning, one that is a great musician, is a definite calling on his life, but yet he won't be under authority. You know, the most important thing for a Christian after they get saved is to sit down under a good teaching authority and anointing and let the Holy Spirit teach them the things they're going to need for this life and for the life to come. Amen? All right. For though I be absent in the flesh, Paul says, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Joying and beholding your order. You know, there's an order in the church. There's an order in the church. There's protocol. There are definite things that we need as members of the body of Christ to practice because it's a, it's a matter of holiness. It's a matter of being sanctified. It's a matter of God's perfecting in us his plan 
and Christ being perfected in us. Amen? Amen. Uh, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. So, and we live in a day and age when everybody wants to walk after a movie star or a football player or a basketball player. I want to be like them. If they're Christians and you want to be like them, that's one thing. But if they're worldly, wide is the way that leads to destruction. Remember that. That's something that, you know, you really need to remember. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be thereon. The Word of God says, multitudes, multitudes standing in the valley of decision. And that valley of decision is rather I'll go with Christ or rather I'll just do my own thing in life. Amen? God wants us to go with Christ. Okay? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, growing, learning and growing and abounding, rejoicing and being thankful. It's so important for us to know that I like what uh, Agrippa said, or, or Paul told Agrippa, when Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, Paul says, King, this thing wasn't done in a corner. This thing was done so the whole world could see it. The reason for, God wants to reach the whole world, not hide us somewhere. There were some in those days that uh, because of persecution, they had a relationship with Christ, and they kept it quiet because they were in positions of authority which would not be comfortable for them to be exposed as Christians at the time that the church was being birthed, okay? But now the gospel goes around the world 24 hours a day. There's no reason anybody should not hear the gospel at least once in their life nowadays. I remember when I was 27 is when I got saved. I remember when I was a child, teenager, working on radios with my cousin in their basement in, uh, you know, whenever. And we would hear Billy Graham on WWVA, Wheeling, West Virginia. But we were, we were just kids, and our families were not church-oriented at all. So we didn't have faith to mix it with the word to do anything with it. We were given poison by our families because that lifestyle that they lived was poisoning us. But then one day God opened the eyes of my understanding and he filled me with his spirit when I ran to him and gave my life to him. Okay? All right. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Because I'll tell you, the world and the devil are out there to steal you from Jesus, to keep you blinded so that you don't come to Jesus, to hinder you and give you every kind of vice that you can have in your life to just keep you from God. That's the whole purpose of it all. Amen? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. We are not circumcised in our flesh. We're circumcised in our heart. Our heart is the place where God comes to dwell. Amen? That blood covenant of the, the original blood covenant made in the flesh was done away with because Jesus is our blood covenant now. He took his blood. He went to the Holy of Holies, sprinkled his blood on the altar, and sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I right this very minute. Amen? Until he comes back. The moment he comes back, it's over. He's coming back 
not as Jesus the child, not as Jesus a young man, not even as Jesus a young minister in the flesh, but he's coming back as the Holy God. He's coming back here in power. And it says that every face that sees him that's not a Christian will cover their eyes for his presence. They can't look upon him because they rejected him. I've got to hurry up. Mm, God is so good. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So when Jesus went to the cross, he triumphed over every enemy that you have. Every enemy of the cross was triumphed over. And when you come to him, you are empowered by him, through him, and through the Holy Spirit to take this message to the world, that lost and dying world, and bring hope and bring love and bring life and peace and joy to them so that they can be partaker of this wonderful relationship that God sent his son to purchase for us. Amen? And Ephesians 2, 1 through 22. I don't think I'm going to have time to do all of this, but I'm going to try. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversion, a conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, and hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, and that's like we're in the final age, the age of the Gentiles, okay? The church age, but the final part of that time, the age of the Gentiles, okay? He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So no matter what we do, we cannot earn our way into heaven. The only thing, the only door that God set was Jesus Christ. And we come to the Father through him and through his shed blood. And it's simple. All we need to do is ask. All we need to do is humble ourselves knowing that God is uh, waiting to hear us call upon him in Jesus' name for salvation. And that this day, if you'll hear his voice, the word of God says, harden not your heart, but humble yourselves. Let your heart be soft and pliable to God and call upon the name of Jesus. I tell you, one woman told us this. She said, I got saved with this statement. Lord, take my life and do something with it. This minister standing here, right here, one day in a battlefield in Vietnam, I didn't understand what I had done. But we were in a firefight. Bullets were flying everywhere. My friend got killed next to me. And I said, God, I don't know anything about you. 
But if you'll save me alive, I'll do anything you want. And about 20 seconds later, well, instantly the firing stopped. I don't know what that was all about, except that it was the most eerie as quiet I ever heard. But about 20 seconds later, I forgot what I said to God because everybody was standing up saying, everything's quiet now, we're okay. And the enemy had been defeated, and we were back in charge again of the area. So I was 19 years old. Wasn't even 20 years old. And it went from then, God let me go my way until I was 27, and he interrupted the course of my life to bring me to himself. Let God interrupt the course of your life today and come to him with open hands and an open heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Father.